Phil Donahue started his career in 1957 as a production assistant in Cleveland. His radio and TV path ran through Adrian, Michigan, Dayton, Chicago, New York. Think 19 Emmys, numerous awards, television Hall of Fame. A think a 29 year run with a final episode of Donahue in 1996. Note it was the longest continuous run of talk show in television history. In 1992, Maury Povich said of Phil that he's the granddaddy of us all and he birthed us and for that we are honored. Most recently he was the executive producer and director of Body of War which he co-directed with filmmaker Ellen Spiro which he screened last night at Chautauqua and for those who were there he's got an incredible amount of passion and a vision. Part of that and I have to bring this up is the movie included uh, music by Eddie Vedder. Now, most of us, I'm looking at the demographics still here, sure. may, may not really appreciate the name band Pearl Jam or Eddie Vedder for younger folks, you know. Yeah, guarantee one or two things. <laughs> but what is critical and important, as far as I was concerned when I read about this, is that the reason the music is in the film, the reason this is very popular, Eddie Vedder or Pearl Jam, did this movie was because Phil and Eddie participated in a fantasy camp for the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> now, I often don't get an opportunity when I talk about Robert Jackson and baseball in the same paragraph, <laughs> certainly never in the same sentence, so I, I, I'm delighted to have that chance. But uh, he's. Uh, our theme this week is 1940, and I will turn this over to Phil in just a second, but sometimes I get the question, how does this all happen? How does this come together? And this is an interesting story because Phil Donahue has always been a fan of mine, as obviously <laughs> given the crowd a lot of people. <laughs> 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 Well, 
That was wonderful. It was captured on film, and we were thrilled. Fast forward to February this year, and this is how it happens, and I give you forewarning to all of those who are uh, colleagues of mine and friends, and you might be former friends because you never do this again, but a guy came up to me on the street corner of 3rd and Main, who was a member of Jehovah's Witness, commented on this particular programs that we had and said, Greg, this is where you take notes, Greg, is there, if there's anything we can do for you, let me know. That was a mistake because I immediately <laughs> had, I said, you know, we don't have this Barnett case if there wasn't a Gobitis case. And if the Gobitis case didn't happen, you know, this whole concept of the great speech and presentation, not speech, but writings of the West Virginia University of Barnett would not have occurred. Is Lillian Gobitis alive? Two weeks later, I get an envelope addressed to Greg Peterson, care of this John Lanetta, and John Lanetta from Lillian Covitis. Next thing you know, she left the phone number. Next thing you know, I'm calling. I think she's very alive and well. And I think, how can I get her up here? Because that's how I work. And she said, I'm strong of, body, or strong of mind, but weak of body. That isn't going to work. How do I orchestrate this? I then set up an opportunity to go interview her in Atlanta. In a shower moment, lightning hit me. I said, you know, Phil Donahue talked extensively about Lillian Gobitis. Let's just call him. And obviously, as a, as a fan, and probably a fan of mine too, he took the phone call. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he took the phone call, and on one week's notice, dropped what he was doing and came to Atlanta where we joined and had a, an incredible opportunity to interview Lillian Gobitis in Atlanta just this past April. Uh, that led to an opportunity for things to occur at Chautauqua with the screen of the body of war and for him being here tonight. And I cannot say how thrilled I really am to have in our presence one of the really, really great individuals on many, many fronts filled out here.